Hello and welcome back to another edition of Around the Association. I'm your host, Charles Fallon, back in here with another episode. And wow, do we have a lot to discuss on the penultimate weekend in the ASCA. Graham Darty is a Cup Series winner at just the age of 20. The Fairmont native gets it done at his home track and we got to break down just the dramatic conclusion to the West Bank 0250. What a race and what a moment for Ford. What a weekend for Ford in general after Caden Dunham slaps up the Craftsman Series field one more time, continuing to shatter records down there in the lower division. Heading into the title decider at Belltown next week. Speaking of the title deciders at Belltown, We'll break down everything you need to know about championship week. It is this week after all, which is hard to believe considering speed weeks feels like it was just yesterday. And now here we are four months later and it's time to crown a couple of champions. One on Friday, one on Saturday. We'll break down everything from the Craftsman Series Championship. You need to know between Gunnar Thorson and Caden Dunham. And then the Cup Series Championship between Braden Bennett and Todd Kidd. We also got to talk about the Ford Development Program. Great week for them per usual at San Diego. And it was a pretty good week for them off the track. Um, heading into a new era, Ryan Dixon, the 2016 Crossman Series champion, 10 career wins, comes back to where it all began. He'll be filling in Sean Wooden's mentorship role in the number 12 next season. And then you've got Theo Russell, taking over for Caden Dunham, the successor in the number 98, which I would say is the new flagship entry for the Blue Oval Brigade, honestly, with how dominant that car has been over the course of the past couple years. And you look at the drivers who have driven it as well. Well, they both won this weekend. So that tells you all you need to know. But first, before we get into it, We got to shout out the ASCA's merch shop. You already know, use coupon code SEASON12 to save 30% off your order at checkout. And if you want to cop some Graham Darty gear, I think this kid proved a lot. You forgot about him? Well, hey, he certainly proved that he has arrived on the scene. And if you want to cop some of his merch, you can do so clicking that link in bio. And then also... Shop Circle B Diecast slash Plan B Sales and use cu- use coupon code ASCA for reduced shipping on any orders thirty dollars or more inside the U.S. So without further ado, let's get into it. And wow, Graham Darty, when you talk about putting on a show for your home bands, that's certainly one way to do it. Um, What a way to score his Maiden Cup Series victory. And I think that the second this kid burst onto the scene back in 2023, let's flash back to that, 17 years of age, his second career start, Colin Ward catching him in the closing laps. And while he allowed Ward to get wheel to wheel with him, coming to the stripe, Darty was able to get just enough drive off to fend off Ward and take his first victory in the ASCA, becoming the youngest winner all time. And that's when you knew this kid, he was going to be special. Then he goes on the next year. He wins the Craftsman Series Championship at the age of 18. 2025, kind of a down year, didn't really do much, but of course got the promotion about mid-season to replace Nick Orchidi and the iconic number two machine for the 2026 season. And now here we are. And I think that Darty has kind of gone under the radar. You know, while everyone's been talking about Dunham, and we certainly will later in the show, considering all the records he shattered, everyone's talking about Thorson, they're talking about Del Al. When it comes to this youth movement, no one's talking about Graham Darty. And I think they are now. Because people, like I said, I think a lot of people forgot how good this kid is. It took him a it took him a minute to adjust to the Cup Series. It did. He he wasn't lighting the world on fire the first half of the season. But you know what he was doing? He was gaining experience. 
He was finishing every single race. I think it took him until the Windows 300, which is the ninth race of the season, for him to get his first DNF, and that was because of a blown engine. You look at his other two DNFs, the one at Denver was because Marcus Edwards just overcooked the corner, ran into the back of him, and then won an Ajax Super Speedway, caught up in um, in big accident. So really has not made any major mistakes this season, hasn't put a foot wrong, and then you look at him in a pressure pack situation like this. It doesn't get any more pressure filled than the end of last Saturday's West Banco 250. Not only was he trying to fend off Colin Ward, and we all know how good Colin Ward is, but let's just say right now, Graham Darty has Colin Ward's number. And um, that just goes to show you again how talented Graham Darty is in his own right. But um, not only is he trying to fend off Colin Ward in the closing laps, but he's trying to save three miles of fuel in 15 laps while Colin Ward is pressuring him in his mirrors. And Darty, again, this kid's only 20 years old. He's a rookie at the cup level, a rookie. A Cup Series rookie winning a race is so unheard of. It has not happened since 2016. And that was Grant Von Duvidel at Ajax Super Speedway, which I think everyone can agree, even with the data analytics, that's a crapshoot. This race, though, call it fuel mods, call it whatever you want. Darty earned that. He earned that victory, that trip to victory lane. No doubt about it. And just the way that the two teams, they've caught a lot of flag. They had obviously the infamous instant at um, Ajax Super Speedway where the piece of bear bond flew off the car and they, they say told him to park it. But give Liam Hightower a lot of credit for the way that he managed this race. I, I don't know if they were being purposefully coy about the analytics and whatnot. But to, especially towards the end of that race, like if Darty actually did save um, three miles of fuel in the last 30, that's insane. Especially, you know, while Ward was pressuring him. Now, if Darty didn't, and if he had more fuel on board than Hightower was leading everyone on to believe, then that's just 40 chess games right there because. We're going to talk about this in a second. I think it's tough to say, you know, like I said, I think Graham Darty's really earned this victory. You can't take it away from him. It's not a Mickey win, obviously. But I think that Colin Ward and the 48 team threw this race away more than Darty kind of um, taking it from them. But give huge props to Hightower because Darty got off to a terrible start to this race, mind you. Started outside pole, dropped all the way back to seven, but he calmed his driver down. Darty began to gradually work his way up through the field. He made the pass on a ward for the race leader lap 93, I believe, something like that. And then um, he just kept drilling it in Darty's head. Hey, save fuel, save fuel, save fuel, max save, max save, max save. And Darty needed every last drop to make it to the checkered flag and um yeah it's just kind of putting into perspective what he just did he's the fourth youngest winner in cup series history again the first rookie to win a race since 2016 and not only is he the first rookie to win a race for 2016 he's the first board to win a race this season the first driver for Akiti Bros Racing to win a race this season. He's top 10 in points now with one race to go as a rookie, a 20-year-old rookie. Again, a kid this young doing this is unheard of. And like I said, when Graham Darty first burst, burst onto the scene, you knew he had it. It's impossible to describe it but you knew he had it. You knew he was going to be special. And this is one of those moments that kind of proves 
how special of a talent he is and kind of reminds everyone while you're all talking about Caden Dunham and Gunnar Thorson and for good reason. Don't forget about this two team, man. They're going to be dangerous next year. You give a an extra year of experience under his belt. Now he's got the confidence of winning a cup race in front of his home fans, mind you, beating one of the best drivers in the sport to do it potentially this year's champion. Although it's basically Ward needs a lot of chaos to go down at Belltown Speed Park to have a shot at the championship. But hey, you never know. Belltown is certainly not known to be a calm racetrack, to say the least. But yeah, this, this team, they're really building something special. And um, I will say this for Katie Burr's racing. While this year has been a disaster for Diego or Katie, we've seen a lot out of Carson Schmidt and we definitely seen a lot out of Graham Darty, um, specifically the back half of this season for both of those guys. And I get that Schmidt's probably not going to be here long term. Um, next year is the last year of his contract, and he's probably gone after the season. But you know, you've got something special in Darty. He could very well be your next Diego or Keaty, um, except hopefully a lot more likable and a lot more clean as a driver. So, yeah, again, just it's crazy what he did. That is some crazy stuff. But it, again, it just goes to show you how talented Fairmont's own is getting it done in his own backyard. But let's talk about the finish to that West Bank 0250. And I want to spend some time talking about the way that the number 48 team, Neil Anderson and Colin Ward, I think, botched this finish and essentially threw the race away. Um. Their strategy towards the end of this race was extremely peculiar. They were kind of almost arrogant and bragging, like, oh, we know the two teams going to run out of fuel. You can just save your stuff. No need to push. We're, we're plenty to the good. They're saying that with about 15 laps to go. So they're just cruising around. They finally release Ward to push with five laps to go. And then on the white bike lap coming off turn two, it ends up being Ward who runs out of fuel with the running, which motorsports cars getting terrible fuel mileage. Um, Todd Kidd barely made it to the checkered flag. That would have been huge if he ran out of fuel. That could have ended his title hopes right then and there. But um, obviously he did, he did end up making it and he ended up finishing, finishing third. But I get that. We really don't have many fuel mileage races in the ASCA. I think the most recent one was last year's race at Michigan, and everyone pretty comfortably made it to the end on fuel. Um, you know, because obviously back in 2024, the ASCA instituted the enlarged fuel tank so that the cup cars can run much longer on fuel than they used to be able to, especially at these bigger racetracks. Um, so, you know, again, fuel mileage hasn't really been much of a factor, but I just, I, I don't, I just think the 48 team got in their own way. And this falls primarily on crew chief Neil Anderson, again, just being extremely arrogant about what was going down at the end of the race. Like, you know, I think that wars should have been released to push if you, if you knew you were good on fuel with 15 laps to go, Ward should have been released to push immediately. Attack right then and there. Because you know, Darty, you know, according to the team radio, we don't know if OBR was being coy about that or not. But our the broadcast analytics were showing that Darty had a very slim chance of making it. And Ward, for some reason, or the team, told Ward to not push the issue. They told him to just wait. Oh, it'll be fine. You don't need to push. I think they kind of knew in the back of their mind that they were getting terrible fuel mileage there themselves. And maybe they were trying to outbox Orkidibur's racing and pressure Darty into a mistake. 
I don't know. It's a lot of mind games and they go into a few mile and finish like this, especially over the radio. Cause you know, they play it on the broadcast so everyone can hear it. So you don't know who's being truthful and who's trying to deceive and it's a mess, but basically I just think that the 48 team wasted a golden opportunity here. They should have released Ward to push much sooner into the run instead of weaning with five laps to go. But then you have to wonder if, you know, if he did push earlier, he probably would have ran out of fuel because he ended up running out of fuel anyways, even though he conserved. So it's a tough situation. I, I get that hindsight's kind of 2020 and this sort of a deal, but I just feel like Neil Anderson and those guys really botched the finish of this race. And um, maybe it was just their indecisiveness. And I don't know. I, I just feel like it could have been handled much better, but regardless, like I said, it doesn't take away from Darty's performance. It's just something that the 48 team needs to clean up if they're going to compete for a championship next season. And I get it. They're still mathematically eligible to compete for one this season. But let's be real. It's between Todd Kidd and Brayden Bennett. So, you know, while Ward certainly can still win the title mathematically, is he going to do it? No, let's just focus on next year. And um, But this is going to be one of those deals where for Colin Ward, I think you're going to look back on it and be like, should I trust my team? If they told me I was plenty to the good on fuel, I save, I save, I save. They finally release me with five laps to go. And then the first second he gets close to challenging Darty, he immediately runs out of fuel. Like it didn't seem like they were even relaying the information to the driver properly. So I I just did not like the way that the 48 team handled the end of that race and um, certainly something that they need to clean up. Although granted, again, we don't see many fuel mileage races in the ASCA, so they probably won't have to clean it up. But hey, if it does happen again, you, you need to be ready for that sort of a situation. And the fact that you let a rookie, a 20 year old rookie out box you in that deal, a rookie driver and a rookie crew chief for that matter, not a good look for Ronnie Woods Motorsports, but that's now back-to-back weeks. They've had one of their drivers lose heartbreakers after being so dominant, um, you know, the entire pretty much second half of the season up to this point. But let's see what's gears. Let's talk Craftsman Series, and there's really not much to talk about other than Kane and Dunham. Um, yeah, Dunham really made it a stinker out in San Diego on Friday night. He just absolutely obliterated the field, tore him to shreds. I think you kind of knew once he stuck in on pole position and you saw the first 19 laps, you could you could kind of tell like, yeah, no one's going to touch him tonight. It was the same sort of deal out of Orlando where he was fastest in everything and obviously was untouchable in the race. Now, this time he did let Travis Wolf lead a practice, but that was about it. So, yeah, for for Dunham, it's a huge championship statement, and it really, it's a demoralizing one, I think, on your op, and that's Gunnar Thorson. Your main op here is Thorson. And for Thorson to be second, On that final restart, he gets Trenton around the outside. What a brilliant move that was, keeping his foot in it, taking that spot, seeing Dunham in his um in his windshield, and then Dunham just slowly but surely drives off into the sunset and kind of drops Thorson off. That's got to be demoralizing, you know, knowing that you're racing this guy for a championship. And Thorson has alluded to the fact that. He doesn't think Taylor Motorsports have the raw pace of the Ford development program. And I think that his confidence is kind of being eaten away at that he has a shot at this, you know. I'll tell you what, when when Dunham's on, he's on. Again, that's why I keep pounding the table for this kid. I keep saying he's a generational talent. B 
because he is. Um, he's one of a kind. Four wins at 18 years old. That's more wins than Thorson. That's more wins than DelVal. That's more, that's the same amount of wins as Graham Darty. And Dunham has done this all in one year. All in one year. What is it? 15 starts. He has four wins. Four poles in 15 starts as well. Four poles in his last seven races. I, what can't this kid do? other than stay out of trouble. That's his one vice. He just can't stay out of trouble. And the only thing is he's got one more week. If he can keep his nose clean at, at Belton, I think he waltzes to a championship. And like I said, we're going to preview that later on in the show. But first, before we look forward, I think we just need to appreciate how historic of a season Dunham has put together because what he's doing right now is truly astonishing. Let me read some stats off to you for what he's done this season. Four wins, eight top fives, 10 top tens, four poles, 345 laps led. That's including a combined 100 and what is it? 250 in the last two short track races. He's won both of them from flag to flag he's pulled off a grand slam pulled position to victory lane so the last two short track races he's let all 250 laps and we had to go short track in belltown next week i'm sorry gunner thorson you know i i like him as a person he's a really cool kid but you, you're gonna have a hard time picking picking against dunham heading into belltown next week Unless, of course, he gets himself into trouble. But again, we'll talk about that more later in the show. And him tying Devin Smith's Modern Era wins record, that's a record that I thought for sure would stand for quite a bit longer. Obviously, it's not broken, but the fact that it's even been matched. And, you know, if there was anyone who I thought would do it, I thought it would maybe be a Tony DelVal coming back for his second year and looking for revenge. Um Maybe even Thorson coming back for his second year. No, it, it's Dunham bursting onto the scene, and he's just, he's just been unstoppable from the word go. Um, started the season off with the DNF, but outside of that, which wasn't even his fault, by the way, outside of that, obviously he's had his fair share of incidents throughout the season, but you look at the last two short track races, his last two wins are Orlando and San Diego. He hasn't been involved in any incidents because no one's been even remotely close to his zip code all night long. So, yeah, th this kid's insane. And um, heading into the final week, we'll, we'll break down the Little Caesars 100. But let me just say, I'm sorry, Thorson, but I don't think it's looking too good for you. Um, speaking of the board development program, time to break down their 2027 driver lineup. So, of course, Jordan Reynard returns to the number 99, the 22 and the 60 return for another season. But now you've got Ryan Dixon taking over for the retiring Sean Wooden in the number 12. And then you've got four star prospect from Idaho, Theo Russell, taking over for the um departing Caden Dunham, who of course we know is moving up to the cup level next season for CJ Barrymore Racing, certainly well-deserved to say the least, but Russell will be taking over the number 98. I think we'll start with um, Russell because there's going to be a lot of pressure on this kid. And Russell, this is an interesting case for me with him because he has not showed me much, at least compared to Darty and Dunham, where you knew even when they were part time that these two were special. And to follow in those their footsteps like Russell has in that car number that's won seven races over the past two seasons, correction, three seasons, those are going to be some big shoes of Bill especially after winning four races this season. Um, yeah, Russell is going to have his work cut out for him. He's a four-star prospect, ASN next class member, so you like that. But 
like I said, with these other four star prospects like Chandler Mills and Zach Trenton, uh, we're not going to know until we see them on track. Are they actually, you know, worth the four star ranking? So it's the same kind of deal with Russell, although at least we kind of see him. We've seen him out there a little bit and he has not. I'm not going to say he's been bad, but he just hasn't done anything. You know, we was up there a little bit in the treatmypz.com 150, but that was about it. So I just, I'm yet to be impressed, blown away by Russell, but who knows? Maybe, you know, he gets a full season behind the wheel and he pulls something out and he is the next Darty or Dunham. But man, he, he's going to have some uh, big shoes to fill next season, to say the least. Now, Ryan Dixon to the number 12, I absolutely love, love, love this hire. This is truly another full circle moment in the ASCA. Um, Dixon obviously beginning, well, actually he began his career at Michael White Racing and then the Ford Development Program poached him in 2016, sipped him over to CJ Barrymore Racing with uh, Caleb Henderson's son in retirement. And um, he ended up being, obviously, the successor in the number six. Has had a plenty, rather successful AS Cup Series career, you can say the least, rather successful ASCA career overall, because in the Craftsman Series, he's been dominant. You know, he's one of, I believe, what, nine drivers to win double-digit racers, double-digit races in the lower division. Obviously, the 2016 Series champion held off Randall Woods to do that, back when uh, Woods was competing for the championship full time. I mean, so basically held off the Craftsman Series all-time wins leader. And that was his rookie season in Cup. So he was a full-time Cup driver as well. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, Dixon, he's going to be 32 years old next season. Yep, 32 years old. Obviously, over a decade of Cup experience, five Cup wins to his name. He's going to be mentoring the likes of Theo Russell, um, Jordan Reynard, you know, some of these other young Ford guys coming up through the pipeline. He fits in perfectly with what Sean Wooden provided. In fact, he's the even better version of Sean Wooden. And they had to pay him accordingly $8 million a season because Revolution Racing, they were heavy after him. But Dixon decided to come back here, scale his schedule back because he's got a child on the way. Um, so yeah, I really like this decision for driver and team and overall for the craftsman series as well. Like the field as a whole is going to benefit by racing Ryan Dixon on a weekly basis. Um, obviously I think he's going to blow the field of Smithereens at Belltown, um, each twice a year, but you know, every, every other week, it's going to be extremely competitive because you know that you're racing, uh, Northern 200 winner, Ajax 200 winner, you know, in his day, in his prime, Dixon was a friend's title contender year in and year out. Remember, he won multiple cup races back in 2018. People thought he was better than Todd Kidd for a time. Obviously, he's not, but, you know, he was on that level with Todd Kidd at the beginning of his career. It just um, didn't really work out at TJ Barrymore Racing. Things kind of got stale. They parted ways mutually. And but he stays in the Ford pipeline. And I think that just kind of goes to show you that the Blue Ovals have done a really good job at keeping their relationships cordial with their drivers. Um, you know, with the way they were able to finagle Atwood out of his Tico Bound Motorsports seat and put him in a CJ Barrymore racing ride. And obviously he goes and wins a championship. And now this deal with Dixon where he parts ways with CBR and he moves down to the Ford development program. They keep him in the manufacturer blue oval brigade pipeline, whatever you want to call it. It's a great move, honestly. And um, yeah, huge for Dixon and huge for driver, huge for team really like the hire. And um, Russell and Reynard are going to learn a lot. And I think that the Ford Development Program as a whole should not miss a beat, specifically those young guys with a guy like Dixon, the, um, the Australian to gleam off of. So, yeah, let's get into it. 
um, breaking down the Craftsman series season finale in the Little, the Little Caesars 100 this Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Just wanted to point out, it's also defending champion Todd Wooden's final race. Certainly going to be an emotional moment for him. There'll be a pre-race tribute for that. Um, yeah, it's hard to believe. He's had, I, I would say, a Hall of Fame career worthy, a uh, Hall of Fame worthy career in the sport. Um, obviously his cup series career was mediocre. He did win two races though. And not every driver can say they've won two races in his best season. He was fourth in points, but he never really stuck, even though Michael Wright racing gave him chance after chance, but you look at what he's done for Ford at the craftsman level tutoring guys like Carson Schmidt, tutoring guys like Graham Darty, tutoring guys like Caden Dunham, all these, um, well, Schmidt and Darty are now cup winners. You look at Dunner, he's certainly going to be a cup winner. I'd say, um, obviously, generational talent, you know, also tutored Ian Adande. He struggled at the cup level this year, but he's still up at the cup level, two-time Craftsman Series winner. Yeah, so I wouldn't, obviously, it's going to be a huge loss not having him on the grid but um, at least Ford will be replacing him with a worthy option in Ryan Dixon. But that's not what you're here for. You're here for the championship. And an interesting footnote for this race, Doug Bowden was supposed to compete in the number 22, but he's not competing because the last minute the Ford Development Program swapped him out for Graham Darty. I wonder why that is. Hmm. Obviously, Dunham is sitting a race away from the championship. They do not want any inter-team drama to interfere with that. It's certainly understandable. I get why Bowden's upset about it, but it, you, you have to understand, like, you're staring down the barrel of winning your third straight championship as an organization. Like, you can't, you can't throw this opportunity away due to some petty inter-team feud that started off over Twitter. Um, Yeah, so heading into this race, Dunham has a five-point lead over Gunnar Thorson. So Thorson has to finish a minimum of five positions ahead of Dunham, or he has to win the race and lead the most laps, and Dunham finishes, what, third or worse to close the championship? Because he's not going to get any tiebreaker for most wins. That's gone away. Um, after obviously Dunham won again at San Diego. So any tiebreaker goes to Dunham. So Thorson has to finish at least five positions or he has to win the race and lead the most laps, basically get max points and then have Dunham finish third or worse, I believe. Something like that. Heading to Belltown, we obviously know the dominance that Dunham has had in the last two short track races. Like I said, I, I, I really I don't see any way you can pick against Dunham, even though he has only ran, what, a third of a lap at Belltown due to the incident with Will Moon earlier in the season. I still trust that he's going to adapt to this track really well, and I trust that he's going to get a top five finish out of it. Like I talked about earlier in the pod, this kid does not feel pressure. There's no moment that's too big for him. Each time this season, he's been um, under pressure. He's risen to the occasion. I don't see why the biggest race of the year for him, one race away from securing his first championship, would be any different. And again, Thorson himself has admitted on numerous occasions to the Motorsports, they do not have the raw pace for the Fords. Well, Thorson, I think, finished sixth or something here earlier this season. Um, I, I just don't trust that he's going to have what he needs to keep up. He And Thorson's done a really solid job at Belltown, mind you, because he's had to come from the back, I think, in two of his three starts here, and he's done that and finished top ten in both. So I think Thorson is sneaky good here. But is he good enough to beat Dunham? I don't think so. And, um, yeah, I just think that if Dunham, that's a big if, if Dunham can stay out of trouble, 
I don't see any way that Thorson beats him on pure pace, but I don't know. I could be wrong. And that's why they run the races. And we'll find out for sure on Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Now let's break down the main event, the Cup Series Championship, the Ajax season finale, next Saturday, this Saturday night correction, 8 p.m. Eastern time, Brandon Bennett versus Todd Kidd. Three points in it. Kidd chipped down the lead two more points um, at West Virginia. And I think this is another slam dunk kind of prediction here. I, I don't think you can pick against Todd Kidd, the defending champion. Um, outside of his little hiccup in the Northern 200, he has been lights out the entire second half of the season. Lights out. I, what is it now? I think it's six top three finishes in his last eight starts or something ridiculous he's been on fire and Bennett while he's been solid he has not he has not shown me enough that he can be an informed Todd Kid. and Todd Kid is another one of those guys who's sneaky good at Belltown now here's the thing I think that track wise Bennett has the advantage Right, you know, because he won the season finale last year. He beat Todd Kidd, passed him on track to win that race, and then drove off and won, even after Kidd had his pit penalty. But Bennett has never been in a title decider. You know, he wasn't in it in his 2022 Craftsman Series title fight, and he has not shown me enough over the course of the second half of the season that he can step up and beat kid mono imano with the championship on the line i mean look at what happened in the last short track race bennett was the one with the pit penalty he was sent to the rear of the field and guess who capitalized todd kid did to win the race i think we're gonna see something very similar to that on saturday um you know todd kid showed just last season he can cope with the pressure of a championship, fighting for a championship in one final race. Brandon Bennett has not done that. And while he's been solid, solid is not good enough to win a Cup Series title. Todd Kidd's been elite. He's been elite since Salt Lake. If you take out those two DNFs, Kidd has been, I would say, driving on the level he was last season. He'd have probably a similar amount of points as well. Just the two DNFs are why... He has a completely run away with this title. And again, that's not to take anything away from Braden Bennett, but Ty Kidd has had to drive at an elite level just to claw himself back into the fight after being last in points. And he's now pushed it to a title decider. Bennett's kind of been, I'm going to say it, he's kind of been coasting. It feels like he's been coasting. He's been doing just enough to keep the points lead. But I think that that just enough is not going to be good enough when Kid steps up his game to another level. And that's why I've got Kid being the first driver since his team owner, Ronnie Woods, to go back to back in terms of taking home Cup Series championships. Um, now, I think that overall, Saturday night's Ajax season finale, whether you're a Braden Bennett or a Todd Kid fan, obviously one of those guys is going to go home disappointed or maybe both of them do, and Colin Ward wins the championship. But let's be real, it's probably not going to happen. You know, whether you're a fan of one of those two guys, one of them's obviously going obviously to go home disappointed. Everyone needs to sit back and kind of enjoy what we're going to be witnessing on Saturday night. The final race for Randall Woods. The final race for Norm Lester. Two historic um, oh, oh, Woods is historic. Lester is not really a legend, but obviously journeyman driver, elder statesman, former Windows 200 winner. He's had a, a fantastic career in his own right, a career that many young drivers would dream to have. And Woods, of course, first ballot Hall of Famer, full stop. It's going to be their final race. And this is also going to be the first time since 2016 and 2017 we've had back-to-back title deciders again it's rare that we see 
title deciders at Belltown. Normally, the championships already locked up heading into this race, and we're just, you know, talking about the final race of the season. But, um, you know, in this case, we still don't know who the champion's going to be. We're saying farewell to two household names, elder statesmen in the sport. Um, we're also saying farewell at the cup level to Ryan Dixon. Um, he's obviously moving down the craftsman series, as we just talked about. It's going to be a race of last. And while, you know, we just entered a new era with the turbo hybrid enter the turbo hybrid engines in 2026, it feels like we're entering an even a new era part two next year with the youth movement making their way to cup and guys like Woods, Lester and Wooden now bowing out and um yeah it's truly going to be the end of an era on saturday night so enjoy it because it's going to be a historic race in the sc history a monumental race both races this weekend are going to be ones that we look back on i feel like in five years that really shaped the sport and um yeah i cannot wait for all the action at the half mile short track, Belltown Speed Park. Next time I come back on here, we'll talk about the two champions that have been crowned. And I'll see you then on the next episode of the pod.